Welcome to Pure Nonfiction, the podcast interviewing documentary filmmakers. I'm Tom Powers, the documentary programmer for the Toronto International Film Festival and artistic director of the Doc NYC Festival. On this episode, I speak with the creators of the Netflix series Five Came Back about the Hollywood directors who made films for the U.S. military during World War II. Mark Harris wrote the book Five Came Back and collaborated on the series with director Laurent Bouzereau. The five men of the title were among Hollywood's biggest directors of the time. Frank Capra, John Ford, William Wyler, George Stevens, and John Huston. Before the war, making documentaries was scarcely on their radar. Capra expresses his feelings. I never saw a documentary. I thought documentaries were silly things that rich kooks made. Yet they felt a calling to enlist their talents for the U.S. to counteract Lenny Riefenstahl's Nazi propaganda films. Capra based himself in Washington to produce a series of films called Why We Fight. His first installment, Prelude to War, describes the enemy dictatorships of Germany, Italy, and Japan. Applauding on cue the words of the leaders. Each system did away with free speech and free assembly. Each system did away with a free press and substituted a press controlled by the party. Through their ministries of propaganda, each took complete control of the theater, the movies, the radio. Every cultural activity and every channel of information was controlled by the most important members of the party. Each did away with free courts and trial by jury and substituted courts and judges run by the party. Each abolished labor unions and the rights of bargaining for wages. John Ford embedded with the U.S. Navy and documented a crucial American victory against Japan in the 18-minute film The Battle of Midway. Navy planes roared from the decks of our carriers, army bombers, marines, thundered destruction over a 300-mile battle area. William Wyler, who had directed the fictional wartime hit Mrs. Miniver, took to the skies for dangerous bombing missions over Europe portrayed in the Memphis Bell. Higher and higher, climbing to reach your best operational altitude, 25,000 feet, five miles straight up. So high you can't be seen from the ground with a naked eye. So high that after one minute without oxygen, you lose consciousness. After 20 minutes, you're dead. The comedy director, George Stevens, adjusted to grim subject matter filming D-Day and the liberation of the Nazi concentration camp at Dachau. And the rebellious John Huston documented the effects of what we now call PTSD in Let There Be Light. It proved so controversial that the U.S. government withheld it for several decades. These are the casualties of the spirit, the troubled in mind, men who are damaged emotionally, born and bred in peace, educated to hate war, they were overnight plunged into sudden and terrible situations. Every man has his breaking point, and these, in the fulfillment of their duties as soldiers, were forced beyond the limit of human endurance. It's an impressive feat in Five Came Back that Harris and Bouzereau weave all these stories together. Harris was previously a columnist for Entertainment Weekly. His first book was called Pictures at a Revolution, Five Movies and the Birth of the New Hollywood, about the making of Bonnie and Clyde and the other 1968 Oscar Best Picture nominees. Bouzereau has a long career directing documentaries about the making of fiction films. He's worked frequently with Steven Spielberg, who serves as an executive producer for Five Came Back. I sat down with Harris and Bouzereau in March in New York City. So, Mark, let me start with you. You'd written... Pictures at a Revolution, about the 1960s new uh, Hollywood. Uh, that was a very well-regarded book. And then you follow that up with uh, Five Came Back, which 
to me, wouldn't necessarily seem like a natural follow-up. In, in Pictures Revolution, you're talking to people with living memory. You can interview a lot more people. I got to think that Five Came Back is not only more of a challenging task because a lot of the main characters are dead, but it also feels to me, and I could be totally wrong here, like a less commercial subject. So I wonder what drew you to that topic. I wouldn't say that it was more challenging. I would say it was challenging in a different way because, you know, the pool of people I interviewed for Pictures at a Revolution were from their 60s up into their 90s. And, you know, I had situations where I was like waking people in nursing homes and saying, could you please talk to me? So the idea of doing a purely historical film book um, where I didn't have interviews as a tool, I knew that was going to be a challenge, but I, I knew that I had really loved archival work on the first book and I, I would find that really interesting. As far as commercial elements go, World War II is a big publishing niche. That hasn't stopped. Huh? And that has not stopped. It's like Lincoln. It's one of those eternal, like as long as there are books, there will be books about World War II. And so I think um, my publisher was actually happy about something that could be on both the cultural shelf and the war history shelf. The films you're talking about in Five Came Back are films that not a lot of people have seen. That, uh, so right. I feel like that's more of a challenge. Yeah, that was definitely more of a challenge. I mean, Pictures of the Revolution felt like living history to me in a way. I, I mean, the, a lot of the people were still alive, and those were movies that I loved and that felt like the beginning of something modern to me. Uh, the The difference between now and the movies of the World War II era uh, I mean, it's staggering. You're literally writing about a different world with different movie rules and different rules, period. Um, I was surprised uh, in the when I finished the book and people started reading early copies of it, I was really stunned by how many uh, movie buffs said to me, oh, it's great that you wrote about these World War II films. It's a shame that they're all lost. Like, there, there was an assumption that these movies did not exist. And that was really one of the reasons I thought, oh, maybe there's an opportunity for a documentary here, because I was telling people, not only do these movies exist, you can find them on the internet, and they're really extraordinary to see. And, and you know, but of course, the one thing you can't do in a book is show them the movies. Laurent, I know your film, uh, Roman Polanski, a film memoir. I know you have a vast career making other behind the scenes documentaries in, in, around the movie business, as well as writing books about them. How did you get drawn into this project? I got a call from Amblin Television, for, for whom I've done a series of documentaries through the years, and Steven Spielberg's office, uh, uh, mentioning uh, this book by Mark Harris. Uh, I'm a film buff, obviously, and also a World War II fanatic. And and uh, having grown up in Europe, you know, I was very much, you know, surrounded by history and, and stories of the war uh, through my family. And so that felt like a project that was just uh, fascinating. And then I got to read Mark's book, and I just couldn't put it down. I mean, Mark wrote this in very much in cinematic terms. Uh, I could see editorially how we would go from one guy to the next and how the, the thing that Mark succeeded uh, so brilliantly in doing is this very vast canvas that is World War II. And yet you experience it through very, you know, five point of views, really. So very personal, very emotional uh, point of views. So I was really interested in, in cracking that also on film. But, you, you know, I was worried about having done this many times, you know, uh, about the cost of, of film clips and therefore the length. And quickly, you know, I was uh, put in a team of producers who were excellent and had very vast experience in, in dealing with Netflix particularly. And they really put me at ease and said, you know, don't, don't, don't bother yourself with this. Tell the story as you feel the story should be told. I think in my laptop, I still have a three-hour outline, a four-hour outline, and a five-hour outline. And we, we figured out viable ways to do all yeah. of them. And, and the clips issue... I mean, Laurent was the first person to say to me, you know, this, don't underestimate the magnitude of how hard licensing is. I remember one of the first things you asked me to do is make a list of the things that we can't live without and then 
underneath it make a list of the things we'd like to have. Um, and I'm really happy to say that in the end, we got everything on the can't live without it list and several things on the yeah. we'd like to have it list. Yeah. Harris's book tells the story through interviews and documents. The Netflix series employs another device by choosing five contemporary directors to speak about their predecessors. Mexican director Guillermo del Toro describes identifying with Frank Capra as an immigrant. He is incredibly eager and incredibly pressured to prove himself. That spirit is still a spirit that he shares with millions of other immigrants from other countries in America. And I think that is not only in him and his career, but in his characters. British director Paul Greengrass talks about John Ford. Ford the man was a figure of patrician authority who believed in duty and tradition and evoked them wonderfully. He was a man who sought solace in alcohol and had a rebel soul and was proud of his Irish rebel heritage. Steven Spielberg explains his affinity for William Wyler. I think what speaks to me the most about Wyler was the fact that he was a Jewish director who was committed to his faith and his culture. He understood what Hitler was doing. He understood what was going to happen to the Jews. Lawrence Kasdan describes the journey of George Stevens. I think at the time that Stevens runs into Capra and says to him, what can I do? He was quoted as saying in his diaries, I wanted to be in the war. It's very hard to get a 50-yard line seat to something like that. And the fact is that he got exactly that. You can't get any more central to the operation than to cover D-Day. Francis Ford Coppola reflects on John Huston and his film San Pietro about a battle in Italy. The generals had felt though he had made a, an anti-war film, and of course his response was, well, if I ever make a pro-war film, I ought to be shot. Harris explains why they wanted to enlist this post-war generation. We realized that we would have the voices of the original five directors um, in the in the movie, but only as old men, um, quite old men, you know, near the end of their lives, which is when people started getting interested in film history enough to to talk to them. And I think we were both a little afraid of falling into the war documentary trap of only old historical voices. And so it felt like to have vital and energetic voices of contemporary directors, which I think all five of, of our guys are, um, it felt like a helpful yeah. way of bringing the conversation into 2017. Well, they speak with passion. They speak with insight about the filmmaking process and the pressures on uh, filmmaking. Uh, but each of them also seems very immersed in uh, the subject matter, m more than I might have guessed. What kind of preparation did they do before this? Did they review the films? Did, did they read Mark's book again? Because they're really yeah. acting almost as historians. Absolutely. They all did their research. I would say that I could be wrong, but I think all of them had already read Mark's book. Uh, um, I remember being on the set of a movie, actually, when your book came out, uh, Jurassic World, and your book was a topic of discussion in between texts. So and not just the dinosaurs. The book amongst filmmakers and the film community and obviously beyond, you know, is a benchmark and was very important. I remember John Schwartzman, our DP on the film, you know, was talking about it with such passion. And when he found out I was doing this as a documentary, I was super excited. But uh, to answer your question, you know, uh, Larry Kasdan, you, you know, who speaks for George Stevens, you know, uh, not only read the book, but uh, uh, read Mark's script. Um, eventually Mark did... Uh, you know, a script for three episodes, and I would give, um, I, I would highlight the directors that they were going to talk about, and so you could, from a visual standpoint, like follow this journey pretty easily. Uh, but but Larry would call me in my car, and we would have all those debates and discussions about 
about not just George Stevens, but just uh, um, the whole project, uh, Paul Greengrass came in and I was really impressed with his knowledge of Ford and how much he identified with him as a himself uh, coming from a documentary filmmaking background and and how he he really could sympathize with the the struggle that Ford was having and uh, yes these interviews are not like I'll give you a half hour no let, let me no, drop it by. was it was extremely you know hard work Coppola walked in with the book and Xeroxes of pages and mark you you know uh, uh, highlights everywhere i was just like oh my god you know this is this is great and stephen obviously blew me away with his knowledge of for example saying well i remember the shot in in uh, the battle for san pietro where the camera pans right and this is not me prompting him or anything you you, you know it's like people may say oh obviously Laurent is prompting them to say something or showing them something. No. And I can guarantee you he had not watched the movie the night before. You, you, you know, it was, it was just knowledge that he has accumulated through his curiosity and through his love of cinema, you know, and research through the years. And, uh, and obviously reading Mark's book. I mean, I was worried that we were asking too much of them. That, that yes. you know, it's, it wasn't like sit down next to this potted palm and say a couple of nice things about someone. You know, it was I thought this if this goes wrong, this could end up like listening to people defend their dissertation or something. But um, they they really came with full tanks and their own not not just a knowledge of everything that I had written in my book, but their own very strong and intuitive and empathetic feelings about these directors and this kind of movie making. But well, let's talk about some of these films. Anyone who's had a film history class would know some of the titles like Why We Fight or Memphis Bell, but I don't know that they're films that that people today go and watch out of passion. Maybe they go and watch out of duty. So I'd love to hear what you respond to in these films. Maybe I could just ask each of you to pick a film that you especially love from this period and, and talk about why. I mean, the first thing I want to say about these docs is they're mostly short. Um, you know, some of the Why We Fight films creep up toward feature length, The Battle of Russia, but you can see The Battle of Midway in 18 minutes, you know, and experience an amazing John Ford movie. I guess I, if I had to pick, I won't pick a favorite, but one I really think people should take a look at is uh, The Memphis Bell, William Wyler's, you know, film of the air war, because I think it's it's such a Wyler movie in that it's it's incredibly meticulous. You know, he did not use miniatures. He did not use recreations. He he even when he had to recreate the soundtrack because it was impossible to record in an unpressurized plane. He he waited until the actual flyers came to the United States and then brought them in to record their own dialogue, which he had taken notes about after the the five flights that he went on. In one scene, the crew of the Memphis Bell observe another B-17 plane in their formation that's been hit and is in a downward spiral. We hear the internal communication of the Memphis Bell crew watching to see if survivors parachute out. Those voices were recorded later. B-17 out of control at 3 o'clock. Come on, you guys, get out of that plane. Bail out. There's one. He come out of the bomb bay. Yeah, I see him. There's a tail gunner coming out. Watch out for fighters. Keep your eye on him, Bill. See any parachutes, Quinlan? Parachutes. So bright at 9 o'clock. Eight men still in that B-17. Come on, the rest of you guys. Get out of there. Come on, Bill. So far, three more shoots. Black, 11 o'clock. Fighters, 16 o'clock. 109 at 3 o'clock. Keep after him, would you? I see him. I'm on them. Come on, you son of a it's really emotional. I mean, the army resisted uh, releasing the Memphis Bell originally, partly because they said you're you're making our uh, flyers seem cowardly by saying that, you know, your stomach is in a knot when you get the news of what your mission is going to be. And and at one point you show them evading enemy fire and we don't want to show our flyers running away from anything. And Weiler fought every one of those points and won every one of those points. He, he, 
this was something that really heartened me because yes, these movies were propaganda. They were made for a propagandistic purpose, but but in the case of something like the Memphis Bell Wyler's appetite for literal truth and emotional truth um, won out. And of course, uh, people saw the Memphis Bell and loved it and did not think that it showed American flyers running away from anything and did not think that admitting that you're scared at the prospect that you might get killed made you a weak or cowardly person. So I think it's a movie that really uh, empathetically expanded people's understanding of what it was like, which is the main thing Weiler was interested in, which is such a natural documentary uh, instinct. What is it like to be here? What is the experience of being in the middle of this? What is the truth of of this unusual circumstance that we're going to show you? I think that's, I mean, that's true of Weiler to me as a dramatic filmmaker, and, and it's true of him as a documentary filmmaker. So I'd pick The Memphis Bell if you want to check out a really good movie. Uh, Laurent? Well, I mean, it's uh, it's it's tough. A uh, uh, midway, I think, is uh, one of my favorites uh, because when I was a kid, I actually saw Midway, the movie, in Sense Around, <laughs> and and got to do a documentary about it uh, uh, years later for a, a home entertainment release. Laurent is referring to the 1976 Hollywood blockbuster, and got to discover through the editor of the film that they actually took footage from the John Ford films and put them in the film. So obviously that knowledge helped me appreciate John Ford's film. And and I think that the fact that he kept shots that were obviously badly framed because a bomb would explode or uh, the sprockets would, you know, you you would have all those warts and all, you know, uh, was just extremely uh, moving to me because it really showed it said so much about what was happening behind the camera as well. So that movie means a lot to me. I, I, I have to say, though, that Battle for San Pietro is fascinating to me because it is staged. And, 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 and to show the outtakes... This is a John Huston movie where he arrived in Italy a day or two after the battle had taken place. And so to make a film about it, he had to reenact it. The reason why I, I love that film is because... Again, as a guy who has spent uh, a large portion of, of my life documenting behind the scenes, discovering outtakes of a so-called documentary where you see clapboards and, and, and someone directing was absolutely unbelievable. And, and in contrast to that, you know, you have the John Huston movie uh, called Let There Be Light uh, about, you know, PTSD. And I have to say that that's the film that each time I, I watch it uh, brings tears to my eyes. So I think, you know, it's almost impossible for me to choose a favorite because uh, uh, there's so many so many interesting images in, in, in all of them and so many interesting uh, revelations and layers to them. And once you watch the series, I think you bring in all this knowledge, you know, to it and are able to hopefully appreciate them or, you, you know, critique them for um, once you have that knowledge. We'll be back with more from Mark Harris and Laurent Bouzereau discussing Five Came Back after the break. If you're in New York City this spring, please join us on Tuesday nights for Stranger Than Fiction at the IFC Center. Each week, we present a documentary sneak preview or classic, followed by a conversation with a director or special guest. The spring season runs from April 18th to June 6th. Highlights include Abacus, Small Enough to Jail, about a family-run bank in New York's Chinatown defending itself against aggressive prosecution. Director Steve James discussed the film on Pure Nonfiction episode 19 just before its world premiere at TIFF. Abacus will screen at Stranger Than Fiction on May 9th. And on May 23rd, the series will present Errol Morris's new film, The B-Side, about photographer Elsa Dorfman. To learn more about the full Stranger Than Fiction lineup, go to purenonfiction.net and click on events. During the war, Frank Capra produced a documentary called The Negro Soldier. The motivation was to make black Americans feel closer to the war effort. 
The film begins with a black preacher, played by Carlton Moss, giving a sermon where he quotes from Hitler's book, Mein Kampf. From time to time, the illustrated papers show how a Negro has become a lawyer, a teacher, perhaps even a minister. It never dawns on the degenerate middle-class America that this is truly a sin against all reason, that it is criminal madness to train a born half-ape until one believes one has made a lawyer of him. This book was written 20 years ago. The plan which it foreshadowed has become a reality. Early on in the war, Frank Capra had the idea uh, that he wanted to make a movie called The Negro Soldier. There had been a poll in Harlem that showed that half of the adult residents of Harlem did not believe that they would be any worse off if the Japanese won World War II than if the Americans did. And this was really alarming to the War Department, which wanted to make a movie, uh, the purpose of which was to show African Americans that this was their war too. So Capra was in charge of this. He recruited Carlton Moss, uh, an African-American, to write it, and William Wyler to direct it. And Wyler and Moss, as preparation, right after Wyler signed up uh, for army duty, went on a tour of bases throughout the Midwest and the South. And Wyler was so appalled, both by the way Moss was treated along the way, being forced to stay in separate rail cars and hotels, and by the way the black uh, soldiers told him that they were being treated not only by white people in the army, but by the townspeople and clansmen in the towns that they were in, that by the time Wilder got to Washington, he told Capra that he was out and that he wouldn't do it, um, that he didn't want any part of uh, painting a rosier picture for African Americans of life in the army than was the case. And um, Capra stuck with the movie. He let Wyler go. He kept on Carlton Moss. Uh, a new director named Stuart Heisler came on, and they made The Negro Soldier, in which Moss also stars. He plays a preacher delivering a sermon, uh, which moves into a portrait of what it would be like for a young black recruit to go into the army. And... Um, the movie premiered in Harlem. The black community was very skeptical about what it would be. Uh, Richard Wright was at the premiere. Langston Hughes was at the premiere. And they were uh, stunned and surprised and delighted by what they saw. They thought they were going to see a movie full of the cliches that they often saw in Hollywood movies. And The Negro Soldier is not that at all. Um, maybe the most surprising thing is that the movie went on to a theatrical release that got bigger and bigger and bigger and ended up being one of the most commercially successful of all of the uh, documentaries that were made by the armed forces. This was at a time when people really didn't go see documentaries in theaters. And um, uh, The Negro Soldier played in hundreds of theaters eventually and was really widely viewed. In your research, did you get any access into understanding more about who Carlton Moss was or, or what he went on to do? There, there are some really um, uh, interesting interviews with him. You know, he was quite uh, an outspoken guy later in his life. And, and he had mixed feelings, I think, about Frank Capra, who uh, had some fairly backwards, um, and naive views about, about race. And, and, uh, I think Moss felt sort of expected a degree of gratitude from him that he was not prepared to show. But he also did say that there was no question that it was Capra's interest in the topic that got the movie made, that, if, that Capra absolutely could have walked away at many points. And the fact that he didn't is, is why we have that movie. And did that experience uh, push Moss's career any further? Or? He, he had a hard time. You know, it, it's uh, one of the, the bones of contention with Capra is that, you know, Capra said, you know, you should you should go into the movies. And Moss said, come on, you know, there are no opportunities for someone like me in Hollywood. And and Capra was sort of like, well, you know, you should just make black movies with black directors as if this was, you know, some thriving alternate industry that were, you know, I mean, there, there were movies like that, but they were few and far between and, and uh, they were not very widely exhibited uh, outside of a small circuit of black theaters. So I think that Moss felt that Capra was kind of 
high-handed about this issue and, and, you know, spoke from a lack of knowledge, which can still get people in trouble even today. Laurent, you have archival interviews with many of these directors, and I, I noticed attributions to previous films called The War Years, A War Remembered, War Stories. So it seems like there have been like different kind of minor iterations of this before. How much interview material did you have access to? A lot. I mean, we, we had access to hundreds of hours of footage. However, those interviews are very difficult to license. Uh, um, and uh, so those were the ones... That, and, these and, like made-for-TV documentaries? Yeah, BBC so. owned or, you know, uh, sometimes also hard to really um, get the type of license that's necessary for... Um, Worldwide rights on Netflix. So. Netflix forever and ever right. throughout no. the universe and in perpetuity. That's so interesting to me because when you say you were concerned about rights, I think about, oh, well, it might be difficult to get uh, rights to a clip from a Hollywood film like The Best Years of Our Lives. but Which, by the way, it is. Yeah, uh, I'm uh, sure that, that is. That was one we were really worried about because the Goldwyn estate uh, over the decades has been notoriously tough about licensing clips from that movie. That movie in particular, you that know. That was the f- one of first discussion I had with you. I said, right. by the way... <laughs> That's a movie we probably will not be able to show a clip because, you you, you know, uh, the Goldwyn Company does not license any clip. Never want this movie to be parceled into clips. That scared me because I thought that that was on my list of movies we can't live without. Um, yeah, and we did get it eventually, and, and and we did get it, and and I think that speaks, of course, for the 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 profile of Mark's book and and uh, the profile of our producer. Yes, I, I think know. more to the latter. Uh, 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 Probably doesn't hurt to have Steven Spielberg no, as listen, a cheerleader. Uh, you, for the- you, you know, your book ha- had made you, you know a lot of the families extremely happy, and 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 right. We uh, had very good support from the wild family and the Stevens family and I, yeah. I do think that that, that helped but but yes there is something about the phrase in perpetuity throughout the universe that makes people think I would like a lot of money <laughs> which is <laughs> Hollywood you know, studios especially a justifiable <laughs> reaction but, although you know what's so fascinating to me about that dynamic is I have to imagine that lots of people are going to watch this on Netflix who probably have never even heard of the best years of our lives and that seeing that clip is going to make you want to go see that it actually increases the value of their movies. But they don't ever look at it that way. That that is absolutely not an argument, uh, sadly. And I have experience in that. And and uh, it is not an argument. And it is a struggle. But you know, again, we had a very strong team, and and it worked out. We did get everything. And and I do hope that almost. The, I mean, there were still some things. We oh, couldn't, you, know. Uh, you know, Fred Astaire. We could not show a clip from Swing Time. You know. Uh, uh, it, it's is just the nature. I mean, I remember doing a piece on on Richard Zanuck and and who produced, you know, a Sound of Music and could not could not show Julie Andrews, you know, because of the rules that came with licensing a clip. You this know. was a big reason there isn't a Pictures of a Revolution documentary. I mean, that was optioned three times by three different teams of, of really talented and well-intentioned people. And, um, you know, obviously that doing a documentary of that would be very dependent on clips from all five of the movies. It's not like you can cut one. And um, it's hard. And it was hard on this. There's times you want to say, like, really? You think I like a minute of... Mrs. Miniver is going to cut into the future earnings potential of Mrs. Miniver? Are you doing a Broadway musical that I'm unaware of or something? But, and even then, well, like, how does that hurt? Right. Like, we just want to get these 70 and 75 year old movies back in front of people's eyes. That's part of the goal. Now, Laurent, I'm curious about your experience making these behind the scenes uh, films about other movies. I have to imagine that there are some big constraints when you're doing that and publicists looking over your shoulder and marketing people looking over your shoulder and that you know, many of those are about the rosiest picture of the making uh, of a movie. And I, I wonder if that is your experience and, and if this was a different process because this, this feels like a very unvarnished storytelling. Yeah, and, and you know, w- one thing to that I want to mention is that I have grown with that sort of industry of behind the scenes documentaries. I mean, they were done 
obviously for for a long time but not to that extent and and really it was uh you know in the early 90s with uh laser discs that that it really started and i basically had full on carte blanche to do if i wanted to interview my mother about jaws i could do it no one would say anything you you, you know and when i did those early documentaries with steven you know they were they never said to me, oh, it has to be under five minutes and you'll have restrictions. There are no rules. I never had any legal problems. In fact, I remember, you'll laugh at that, Mark, is the first contract that Universal gave me to do the making of 1941 and then Jaws was for a theatrical movie. So it was like deliver Dolby tracks and deliver this and that. And I said, "Uh, I'm not going to sign this. This, I'm not making a movie. I'm doing a, a documentary. And I said, it doesn't exist. We don't have a template for it. Just sign this. It protects us. <laughs> don't worry about it. We'll never uh, uh, reference it. And I kept it because it is the most hilarious uh, uh, document that I have. But it is true that with uh, uh, the importance of that industry growing, uh, uh, guilds got involved. Uh, um, so therefore, we could no longer do anything longer than 30 minutes. But we could do a five-hour aggregate documentary on any subject but they had to be split up into 30 minute increments Mm. you know so uh, and that has to do with SAG that has to do with all kinds of of rules Um, and yes you know I I kind of uh, um, live through the marketing department uh, where where there are rules and 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 we do want to to sell the product and 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 get people in the theaters but i still feel that um and i've been very privileged that way to work with the steven spielbergs and and william Friedkin and and all the great directors that i've had the privilege of working with you know um that i i have a fair amount of freedom on five came back There is a tension that's discussed in the film about the process of making any war film, and that is a tension between uh, celebrating the heroics that can happen uh, in wartime, but also being clear-sighted about the brutality and inhumanity uh, of war. And I and I wonder in in your taking on this project how you balanced that yourselves it's a strange thing because uh, yeah i'm really aware that world war ii documentaries are a a genre and and there are people who take them in in a kind of all-you-can-eat way and and people who feel that any war documentary ends up um being uh in some ways any war film ends up being a celebration of war i think john houston uh thought that and was worried about it um you know and he probably wasn't the only director george stevens was very concerned you know he made shane as his world war ii movie i think because he he felt that making an actual world war ii movie would just inevitably end up being what you're concerned about and um you know (coughs) i think that you you can't go into a project like this defensively i i mean you you can't if you brace yourself too much against uh what you make in something like five came back being misused or or enjoyed in the wrong way by people you're you're going to paralyze yourself but but i think i hope that it will be hard for people to watch these um three hours and come away feeling that a war is a wonderful thing and that this was nothing but an experience of excitement and heroism. I mean, to to me, as different as the five directors that this is about are, one thing that united them is that although they all had their own reasons for going into the war, what the war actually was really caught them up short. And, you know, it was not the adventure that John Houston thought it was going to be. John Ford thought it was going to test his courage and it did, but it left him haunted by the courage of people who he thought were much braver than he was. Weiler left the war a disabled veteran and it took him really quite some time to recover and believe that he would ever work again. Um, George Stevens was so shattered by what he saw at Dachau that he never made another comedy. And although he went on to an extremely distinguished career as a director of drama, that was a loss and, and a loss that many of his colleagues felt. 
Capra, after It's a Wonderful Life, could never regain his his footing. So the the cost of war, obviously, period, is immense. And, and there are people who um, sacrificed uh, much more, including their lives, than these men did. But it, it turns out that even the cost of picking up a camera to record the war um, it comes with costs. And, and so in that sense, you know, while you can come away with renewed, I hope, admiration for the directors, I don't think you can come away thinking that this was an adventure or a lark or uncomplicated. I want to thank Mark Harris and Laurent Bouzereau for speaking with me. Harris's book, Five Came Back, is available in paperback. The three-part series is now streaming on Netflix, along with many of the films we've discussed. Pure Nonfiction is distributed by the TIFF Podcast Network. This interview was recorded at the School of Visual Arts, where I teach at the MFA Social Documentary Program. Thanks to our team, series producer Michael Scotty Jr., sound mixer Kyle Murphy, web designer Cross Strategy, marketing coordinator Sarah Moto, social media master Jordan Smith, and executive producer Raphael Nehausen. I'm Tom Powers. You can follow me on Twitter at T-H-O-M Powers. If you're in New York, check out our screening series, Stranger Than Fiction, on Tuesday nights at IFC Center. The spring season begins April 18th. You can read our show notes, learn about live events, and sign up for our newsletter at purenonfiction.net.